Hey everyone and welcome to the Sunny Go One Piece podcast. On this episode, we're going to be talking about anime episodes 128 through 130, which will be covering manga chapters 213 through 218. And here we're at the conclusion of the long-running Alabasta saga. But this story has a couple more emotional moments and some crazy twists and turns still left, so I can't wait to get into this. And let's start off with the synopsis. So we find out the Straw Hats are all recovering from their battles and injuries. But once Luffy wakes up, they all go into celebration mode, partying it up. And during all this, and after the party, Bibi contemplates whether to stay in Alabasta with her people or continue adventuring with the crew. But with the Marines in hot pursuit, there isn't much time for her to decide. So the crew decide to leave after the party is over, with Bibi ultimately deciding to remain in Alabasta after a very emotional farewell. However, to everyone's surprise, there is a stowaway on the Going Merry. So the differences, there are a few differences in these episodes. For example, during the escape from Hina, there's a moment where Luffy trips over a pile of harpoons that Chopper collected and then unknowingly flings them all towards a few marine ships disabling them. This small scene is not present in the manga during their, you know, their escape. The other thing is the reveal that uh, that Pell is still alive is a bit more understated in the manga as all we really get to see is the doctor lifting up Pell's headdress and calling to him that he forgot to take it with him. Whereas in the manga, it seems like they have like a longer conversation about like taking care of himself and that he's still not really recovered. And Pell's just sort of anxious to get back to the palace. And then on a similar note, we obviously get that scene at the very end of episode 130 where he's at his own grave and he's shocked about it. That moment is actually not in the manga either. And then during the end montage... While the montage is actually present in the manga, we do get a couple more scenes added into the anime version as we see the uh, the sand pirates as well as the those fake rebellion fighters woven into the story as we saw them in the two filler episodes. And then fast forwarding a little bit, one strange change that I noticed during when Robin's joining the crew is that in the manga, for some reason, after the flashback of Luffy carrying Cobra and Robin out of the chamber. Luffy and Zoro are magically changed into their normal clothes out of those like temporary robes they got in Alabasta. However, in the anime, it has them wearing these robes for the whole episode and even into the next few episodes. It seems like a weird continuity problem in the manga, actually, as it seems like they all just kind of left and got changed while Robin was talking and not really listening. <laughs> I don't know, it's it's very it's very weird. I mean, I know why it, he changed their clothes because in the manga, th- that scene transitions straight into the next arc, so there's not really a moment to do that. But it looks really weird in the manga. And then obviously, the, clearly the end is very different, as in the manga, after Robin joins the crew and she's done talking to Zoro, the events of the next arc immediately begin. But here they just sort of end and we go into a stretch of filler episodes following episode 130. But with that, let's get into my thoughts on the episode. So I love this little funny moment with Chopper and and the Alabasta Doctor and all the praise heaped on him because Chopper goes, he goes into this, his bashful mode and starts just bad mouthing people, even though everything else about him is really happy and appreciative of all the uh, praise and the compliments that he's getting. And I love how he's still like calling him an idiot while pulling out a chair and pushing a tea towards him. <laughs> it's pretty funny and cute. We then catch up with everybody else in the crew as well. And we also see now that Zoro is able to balance these like massive boulders on his arms, which is crazy despite orders from Chopper not to move at all in the first place. And I think this is like now that we've seen Zoro in Alabasta, you know, before Zoro was crazy strong, don't get me wrong, but I but it's funny when you go all the way back to like Syrup Village and he's just like shocked at how like Butch is like <laughs> throwing like these boulders at him. He's like, "What crazy strength." And then here it's there's like a leap or something in Alabasta where Zoro gets this sort of character trait that he's just absurdly strong, like superhuman strong. And, you know, he's, like, lifting up buildings now. And, like, his training involves him balancing these, like, huge boulders on both of his arms while he's meditating. And and not that I'm, not that I have a problem with it, but it's just funny how this sudden turn of, like, just amazing strength that Zoro has, has just sort of been 
exaggerated i feel like and this this alabasta arc is like i feel like where that turn happened there's some really comedic moments in the following scenes like someone complaining about all the walls sanji smashed while trying to run through this city and i love how sanji's just like uh let's just go that way (laughs) and once luffy wakes up we get some of my favorite jokes of this series so when igaram's wife terracotta comes with all the fruit and veggies Then Luffy just eats this mountain of food in an instant and (laughs) Sanji used the classic Tsukumi humor and just yelling at him, are you a magician? (laughs) This joke and the delivery of the lines are just so perfect and like unexpected. I burst out laughing every freaking time because it's just like Luffy, the way Luffy just grabs the food and it's gone in like an instant and then Zoro and Sanji are just yelling, Tejina Kayo! (laughs) Uh, It's too funny. I also really love that small callback of uh, Zoro noticing that Igaram likes to cross dress, <laughs> but it's the but it's his wife. But it, he looks too similar to his own wife, and even Zoro comments the fact it's like there's kind of a limit to how much you can look like your own spouse. <laughs> and then finally, the the following dinner scene is just a barrage of cascading jokes. Whether it's Luffy eating everyone's food and Usopp getting re- revenge on him by putting a Tabasco star on <laughs> on his food. Or Chopper choking on his own food because he needs to eat quick or else he's, he's afraid he's going to lose out on food to Luffy because Luffy's eating is just way too fast. And then the absurd reveal that Lashes is there eating while s- s- sitting upright with a knife and fork in his hoops, just to name a few, are pretty funny. So the next scene after the dinner scene, I have a few mixed feelings about the bath scene. There are a few things I like about it, like Luffy and Usopp just messing around and Zoro getting annoyed at them, especially when they're sitting under the cascading water saying, we're training, we're training, and referencing that trope in samurai movies where the warrior trains by sitting and meditating under a waterfall. And Zoro's response here is hilarious too with, training for what? I also think that it's really cute that the Zoro is taking up that sort of big brother role again with Chopper and he's washing Chopper's head and it's pretty cute. And then I also really like the scene where Cobra thanks everyone, not as a king, but as a father and a citizen. But yeah, the part that really bothers me, and I think you all know what I'm going to talk about, is them peeking at the girl's bath. I just feel like this was the first, like, it just first off inappropriate, but also super creepy considering it's Cobra who's enthusiastically telling everyone where it is. It's super weird and creepy because that's his own daughter. Like, why the hell would he, A, want to sneak a peek at his own daughter, and B, why would he want all these other guys oogling at, you know, or ogling at her in a bath? I just never liked fan service moments like this where it it feels almost, like, predatory. Like, this and earlier where Mr. Two flashes the guys as Nami. Even though I could live without it, I get Oda likes to have Nami in skimpy outfits, but... At least from a story perspective, that's her choice to wear those. She chooses to dress like that. But when it's forced on her like these two moments, I kind of get uncomfortable. Especially when you consider the primary target audience for these shows and comics. They're aimed primarily at preteen uh, to teen boys. And it sends a really messed up message that this kind of behavior and view of women is okay and even funny. The fan service does crop up more and more as the series goes on, but thankfully it never really gets this uncomfortable for the rest of the series apart from maybe yeah yeah i guess there is one moment that's kind of even worse than this moment in punk hazard now that i think about it or not punk hazard i meant thriller bark but we'll get to that moment when we get there but anyways so the crew decide to leave the island as the marine presence continues to grow while vb struggles to decide whether to join them or on their adventure or not i know it tries and plays it up like she might actually join them but it's kind of obvious that she'll stay behind. I mean, it's really the only logical conclusion after fighting so hard for her people and just when they need her the most to rebuild. She just can't, like, up and leave, I feel like. Later on, we flash back to a conversation, and they give Bibi some time to make her decision as they will pull up to shore one last time to give Bibi a chance to board the ship if she does want to join the next day. I do acknowledge that from her perspective, it's a really tough decision. Does she stay with the crew and continue adventuring or stay behind to take care of her country? Like true to her character, Vivi is all about responsibility and caring for others. She knows the people that need her the most are her citizens and that she more than knows that the crew is capable of taking care of themselves. And I really like that because, I mean, even from the 
beginning, BB has always been a worry wart. And even though she's seen how strong they are, she, she never stopped worrying about them. But I feel like over the course of this arc, and by now, she has complete trust in them and believes that they really can do anything. And I really like that little small like character growth. In the next scene, though, we get some really cool info about the Straw Hats, specifically Luffy and Zoro. So the Marines have set new bounties, and Luffy is now worth 100 million berries, which is insane, as that's now 20 million above what Crocodile even was, which makes sense, but it's just incredible to see Luffy surpass a bounty that we thought was just an absurd bounty and seemingly an insurmountable antagonist just like 60 episodes ago. And not only that, but now Zoro has a bounty worth twice what Luffy's initial bounty was at 60 million berries. But they all leave without learning of this news, and so they don't even know how much they're worth now, which should be interesting to see. All in all, this is really exciting as a fan of the series to see these kinds of like progress reports on our characters. And, uh, and I love these moments throughout the rest of the series whenever bounties get updated and whatnot. And moving on, we get the return of Django in full body, now fully marine soldiers serving under Hina, just where we left off at the conclusion of their cover arc, or cover story arc. And like I said, these cover stories all seem to play a role in the bigger main story. So again, I'm going to express my confusion as to why they're never animated as, f- as quote unquote filler episodes. And we actually get random filler episodes. Also, fun fact, the instrumental music that plays in the background during their reintroduction is actually a folder 5 song called ready which is the same group that sang the second opening believe this was actually used in a short film called Django's dance carnival that was attached to the second movie clockwork island adventure which actually takes place on miraball island that was featured in the Django cover story you know just a little fun trivia fact for you because i in researching this i realized that this was never released outside of Japan. I, I only know it because it was on included on the VHS copy of the Clockwork Island adventure that I watched when I was a kid. And I just, I never realized that this was never released in America for, or even outside internationally for that matter. I have to mention though, that small gag where they both get Hina flowers and they ask her to ask them why they were late. And as they're professing their adoration for her, she doesn't even let them finish their sentence. She just tells them, I don't I don't need them. And then go get the straw hats. (laughs) Uh, It's just the way Hina talks. It's just so funny. There's just something about her performance. It's just like just how she says, (laughs) anyways, we finally get the culmination of all the breadcrumbs and foreshadowing of Bonkle becoming friends with the straw hats. And he's actually defending the going merry from capture and no longer has any ill will towards them with the baroque works gone i gotta say i was actually really happy about this because when they first met him and like i mentioned in the last in the last few podcasts he was just so hilarious with luffy usopp and chopper and i love that they just fall right back into the same groove as they as they realize that he saved the merry from the marines so like i mentioned episode 129 contains one of my all-time favorite moments in all the entire series. It's the day of Vivi's first speech as a princess, and we find out that Vivi is in fact actually really young at 16 years old. At this time, which was quite a surprise given her maturity and similar design to the others, I thought she'd be more in line around like 18. I know she was a slightly younger than everybody, but I didn't realize she was 16. During this time, the Straw Hats are busy fending off a barrage of attacks from Hina, Django, and Full Body, with the Mary taking some serious damage while waiting for Bibi's answer. But thanks to Usopp's crazy skilled yet lucky shot, he takes out Full Body and Django's ship at once, creating an opening for them to escape, but Luffy and the others don't want to leave until the promised time. Upon hearing the reason that they're waiting for their Nakama, Bonkle is moved and is slightly ashamed of himself, and this is the point where if you haven't already fallen in love with Bone Clay, you will now. As he decides that he needs to stand up for his friends and decides to stay behind as well as to help the Straw Hats. This is also a good time where the distinction between the terminology of Nakama and friend or Tomodachi is really highlighted. And why I've used Nakama as almost a completely different term since it really is a different term. 
Bonclay and the Straw Hats now consider themselves friends or tomodachi. However, there's an even closer bond the Straw Hats share with each other and with Vivi, and that is referred to them being their nakama. And of course, this becomes particularly important towards the end of this episode. But yeah, just like with when I mentioned it during Arlong Park, that word is very important in this context of One Piece. And there's just nothing like it or an equivalent to it in English, so I just could keep using nakama. So with that, Bonkai decides to use his powers to transform into Luffy and lure Hina and the Marines away while giving the Straw Hats time to go pick up Vivi, which for a character that was primarily an antagonist just a little while ago is an incredible turnaround, but one, of, one I never questioned because Oda did such an amazing job of balancing him to be a villainous threat and a lovable character. That combined with all the development and foreshadowing makes this a pretty natural and satisfying you know, epic moment with his Okamawe speech, sacrificing himself to buy time for Luffy. <laughs> I love, I love how his crew members are the one like dropping the uh, Sakura f- uh, leaf petals <laughs> to create that dramatic effect. It's not an anime effect; it's an actual in-universe effect that his own crew is doing for him. Especially when they're like on the doorstep of being killed or captured. And I also really love that this sacrifice isn't lost on Luffy and they're all actually really moved and vow to never forget their sacrifice. It's left ambiguous as to what happened to Bonkle at this moment, but you know, we do find out a little later that he is captured by Hina in the very next episode. But hopefully this isn't the end for him. Alright, now onto the main event, Vivi's speech. So the speech itself is really an emotional tribute to the Straw Hats. Even though they can hear the speech, everyone but Luffy is convinced that Vivi isn't coming, but Luffy won't give up until he sees proof. But twist! It's Igaram cross-dressing as Vivi one last time while Vivi did make it to the coast to meet them, but it's not to join them but to say one last goodbye. And I can't tell you how amazing this moment is because it's the first time we've actually had to part ways with a crew member and it's done so perfectly. As we get a quick flashback again to the moment they decide the signal to tell who among them is the real one and where they decide on the second layer of having the cross under the bandage signifying that this is their real sign of being a nakama. And again, Misa Watanabe freaking knocks it out of the park with her performance, emotionally asking the crew if they were to ever meet again, would they welcome her back and call her a nakama once more. I always begin to tear up when Vivi starts to cry too, and when the crew can't respond because if they did, it would label Vivi as a criminal to the marines who are listening from a distance. It's pretty heartbreaking for that small moment where it's just silence with them being unable to tell her how they really want her back and Vivi beginning to cry even more. It's just so sad that this is how they have to part ways with Vivi having her heartbroken thinking that her nakama have basically moved on from her. But then the most awesome and cathartic moment happens as you can see in the distance the entire crew all six of them raise their arms in silence to display the black x to signify that no matter what happens this sign will always mean that they're nakama and then in turn vivi and karu also lift up their left arms to show their black x's and i can't tell you how much i have loved this scene since the first time i read this and then get, getting to watch it in the anime is also just as amazing it's just one piece's long form of storytelling at its best it took a long time to get here but i think it's precisely because it was built up that this moment will stand as one of the best and most memorable moments in one piece they even have attractions in japan where you can reenact this moment and stand side by side with the crew and get a photo op i unfortunately haven't been there yet but hopefully someday i'll get a chance to do this i also often joke that even though i myself would never really get a tattoo if i were to get one for whatever reason it would be this black x on my left forearm I mean, that's how much I love this moment. And after a thousand plus chapters and 980 plus episodes, this still stands as my second favorite moment in the entire series. I mean, then to top it off, the episode ends with we are all of a sudden just blaring over the conclusion of this episode. It's just so perfect. I mean... This moment, yeah, like I said, is easily my second favorite moment in the entire series. Vivi's farewell is one of the most emotional and awesome moments of the series. And what the series is at its core, it's the relationships and the nakama we make along the way. And this is the first time we actually have to say goodbye to two of them. It's built up so well putting you on 
a roller coaster of emotions of Vivi's coming to the coast and then is she not coming? And then she's joining, but then we find out she's not joining, but she wants to join again someday. But will the Straw Hats accept her back? Then the Straw Hats want to respond, but they can't. Then after all those highs and lows, we finally get that big release of yes, even though she's not going to be traveling with them, she will return as well as Karu. They will always stand as Straw Hat crew members. And ah, oh, it's such an amazing moment. I just love it. I cannot speak enough about this moment. It is so good. However, if that's not enough, the emotional ending to episode 129 was crazy. But then we get this really surprising episode 130. And we get an interesting moment with Hina as we get to see her conversing with Smoker about how she notices that there's a subtle hint that Smoker is actually happy that the Straw Hats escaped. And I think we all suspect at this point that Smoker is kind of fond of the Straw Hats now, seeing what kind of people they actually are, even if they call themselves pirates. And we also get to see Hina's devil fruit briefly as she has the ori ori no mi or the cage cage fruit and it looks like anything that passes through her gets locked up in some steel restraints which are actually kind of cool and i'm curious to see how she'll actually utilize these powers more in the future and then at the beginning of the episode we also get a long montage of the citizens of alabaster recovering and getting back to normal as well as seeing what has happened to uh, some of the characters that we've met along the way all set to the first ending theme memories and i find it poetic that the last episode ended with the opening theme we are and this episode opens with the ending theme memories and one shocking thing that's revealed during this montage that i have to mention is that pell is alive somehow I talked about this in the spoiler section of the previous podcast, but I find the fact that Pell is alive is really stupid and kind of cheap. I mean, it's Oda trying to have his cake and eat it too. Like, he killed off quote-unquote Pell to create that incredible dramatic tension when he sacrificed himself, but the fact that he survived that blast is both implausible and just nonsensical. All it does is it cheapens that moment on rewatch because it was essentially meaningless. While Oda does take great care not to kill off many characters, sometimes the length he goes to is just a little too far and it's kind of becoming a bit of a meme how essentially if you don't get a complete and utter confirmation someone is dead, no one is actually dead uh, in One Piece and if they die you know, off screen or don't actually see the finishing blow, then you're better off assuming that that person is still alive and will return at some point in the series. And sometimes these make sense and are used to great effect, but most of the time I'm just like, really? How did they survive that? And why are they still here? Anyways, with that rant over and the Alabasta arc as well as the saga over, let's move on to the major development of this episode. So we find out that Nico Robin is still alive and is now on the Mary wanting to be part of the crew. So this reveal was shocking and very unexpected, but I was unfortunately spoiled of this reveal because my friend had the most recent uh, issue of Shonen Jump, and it happened to have chapter 217 in it. And so I saw this almost like three to four months early before I'd even been able to read the volume 23. So it was really crazy to see with her see her with the crew or I guess I should say volume 24 and we get to see the moments just after Luffy beat Crocodile and how they all got out of the chamber and we get quite a few huge info drops as well as insight into what Robin really wants. We learn that Robin was the one who had the antidote to the poison and cured Luffy. Then Cobra reveals that the Alabasta Poneglyph did indeed have information on the Pluton. So we learn that Robin did in fact hide that information from Crocodile to stop him from getting that. And her real goal was to find a particular Poneglyph called the Real Poneglyph that is said to contain the real history for 20 years that she's been searching for this. And it's still unclear what real history means, but it must be something that has been lost or hidden away. Then there's this really humanizing moment for her as she talks about this goal of hers is actually a dream that has too many enemies. And I don't know why, but I was always affected by the way she says this line. Of course, her enemies are much more dangerous, but we've all had a dream that seems to always have too many obstacles thrown at us in pursuit of it. And, and that feeling of wanting to give up is all too real and relatable here when it comes to our own personal dreams and goals. And I think for me, yeah, when I originally read this, and particularly when I saw this, like just the the way um, Yamaguchi Yuriko actually performs this moment is pretty incredible. And I always, for some reason, tear up when I hear her say that. But another important bit about Robin's dream is that now that we know she has one, just as insurmountable and distant, 
She fits in very nicely with the other crew members and their grand dreams. As we've come to sort of recognize that in order to be a member of the Straw Hats, you need a dream, and she's got one. And surprisingly enough, it fits pretty well. And after learning about this sort of real history in the Rio Poneglyph, Cobra starts asking a bunch of questions to Robin, but before any of them could be answered, Luffy gets up and picks them both up and presumably just jumps out of there, saving them all. And Robin had all but given up on life, but Luffy refused to just let her die because, well, that's Luffy. He saves people, and even if they don't want to be saved. Back in the present... Luffy just agrees to her joining the crew. This does seem kind of sudden, but at the same time, it, it really doesn't. This is a character we've seen and interacted with consistently since Whiskey Peak, and although we don't get Vivi joining the crew, we still get a new member in Robin. As I've kind of alluded to in the podcasts as well, outright talking about it in the spoilers, there was plenty of foreshadowing and hints dropped throughout the saga. She never outright kills anyone like with Pell or Igaram. She straight up saves Luffy and always had more curious to positive reactions to the Straw Hats as Oda made sure to always include close-ups of her looking at the Straw Hats as well as how by the last battle she's beginning to like Luffy and when she genuinely laughs at Water Luffy like that's a really good uh, example of this and it's kind of funny how looking back on it we see all these little clues. I personally was really intrigued by this turn of events as Luffy totally trusted her and Luffy's almost never wrong about his trust in people and his sort of his sort of superhuman ability to judge a person's character and connect with them utilizing his genius level social and emotional intelligence. However, I like many other people were still a little suspicious of her like Zoro and Nami are initially. Of course, Nami's suspicions get bought out pretty quickly with treasure. <laughs> And Usopp is brought on board with another one of Luffy's classic crewmate impressions with the help of Robin this time using her sprouting hands as antlers to imitate Chopper. And I, I love how Luffy even goes as far as to like sort of do the, um, the Vulcan salute with the two fingers and makes like Chopper's hooves. <laughs> it's pretty funny. And sort of through Usopp's interview, we kind of get caught up to speed on Robin's per personality a little bit more. We learn that she's an archaeologist, so she fills that position, which was a position I never thought even existed, and has been on the run since she was eight years old, hopping from one rogue organization to the next, as we learned a while ago in her confrontation with Tashigi. But regardless, with much of the crew on board, Robin's now officially a new member of the crew, and we don't get that traditional celebration and cheers moment like the other crew members have so far, but that's to be expected due to the unorthodox nature of her joining. And then we get an odd cliffhanger with Pell learning of his grave. But I'm just going to save you all the trouble. Nothing ever really comes of this thread. So yeah, that's the Alabasta saga now complete. You know, the next several episodes we move into some filler stories, so I'll cover those in one episode like I normally do. But next week, I'm going to do a mini episode just giving my review of the entire Alabasta Arga arc and saga as a whole but yeah i hope you enjoyed this i know this is a longer episode but yeah if you did enjoy this send me a like or a comment if you want to join me on this journey of rewatching one piece or pl please consider subscribing check out my instagram and twitter account at sunny go podcast for updates as well as pictures of my manga collection that is and stay tuned for some spoiler discussion as I do have quite a few topics I want to talk about in spoilers, as if this episode wasn't already long enough. But if not, I hope to see you on the next episode. Bye. Alright, so spoiler section. So yeah, this is going to be largely unscripted, but I think the first thing we should talk about is Vivi. So obviously Vivi shows up again um, at several points in the story. Usually whenever something huge happens with the Straw Hats and you see her reacting to it, like whether it be their assault on the Ennius Lobby or at Reverie, you know, we see Vivi's reaction anytime their bounties go up. And it's cool to see her return in that capacity but i think i you know my my prediction is that but by the end of the series that vb will actually return to them as part of a crew member like and at least help them in their final battle and at least that's my hope i really want to see vb and karu return to the crew and sort of actually be active participants because she is a straw hat member and i really want to see her rejoin with everybody and it'll be funny it'll be funny to see her um with robin and see see what her reaction to that is because i mean we do kind of get a reaction to robin joining the crew but 
you know, she's she puts her trust in Luffy. And so if Luffy trusts her, then Vivi also trusts Robin. And then speaking of returning characters, we also uh, do eventually go on to see the return of Mr. Two or Bentham and uh, Bonkle. Uh, he's got like a bunch of different names now. But yeah, he returns very surprisingly. I was very pleasantly surprised to see him return at Impel Downs and just sort of see him help Luffy once again and just that devotion and that friendship still very much strong and I very much love the Impel Down seeing you know um, Bon Clay as well as Bucky and um, Galdino or Mr. Three return like all of them kind of like banding together and even even Mr. One, Daz Bonus, and Crocodile come back in Impel Downs. Impel Downs is going to be really fun to talk about uh, just because of all those returning characters. But it's great to see Mr. Two return because he, he was such an amazing character. The other little thing I wanted to talk about, and this will crop up a little bit more in the next, you know, the Skypea and with Water 7. But here we, you know, we've seen another example of the Going Merry taking some severe damage you know we had with at um at the twin peaks we had the breaking of the mass the breaking of the figurehead due to the conflict with laboon and now we see that mary the mary has taken like several harpoon shots to its main hole and it's just starting to rack up the damage and this is sort of leading up to the damage that they sustain getting to skypea falling from skypea And just all the damage that it's sustaining, like it's building up. And this is probably the second like big instance of that happening, leading all the way up to, you know, Water 7 and being declared that Mary can't go on. And, you know, seeing this is really sad, actually. Like, you know, upon rewatch, looking at how the damage that that the Mary is taking. Because when you, at least for me, when I was originally reading and watching One Piece, like I never really thought about the Mary ever actually being damaged to the point where for where she can't be repaired and it's really sad to see like to see because like you know when you watch it you're just like oh you know the mary alike with the rest of the crew they take damage but they'll eventually you know they'll pop right back up they'll go back to normal but it wasn't the case with mary and the mary was always taking damage and while it was fixed it can't recover like our human characters can and just seeing all that damage just rack up you know especially on upon rewatch knowing what's going to happen with mary is just really sad like (laughs) it still amazes me to this day how this mm, this story has made me cry uncontrollably over a ship um (laughs) So yeah, it's 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 kind of sad to see Mary just take so many shots here. And then the final subject I kind of wanted to talk about with the spoiler section is everything concerning Robin and all the revelations surrounding her. And we learn that, you know, the Rio Ponego has the quote-unquote real history, and that's referring to the Void Century that gets brought up in Robin's full-on flashback backstory where we got it in NES Lobby and what she's had to endure like I think rewatching this after you've seen NES Lobby and seeing what Robin's had to go through, it just it makes it really sad that she just wants to know what this Void Century was so that she can, you know, keep keep the the researchers their memory alive in Oha who were just wiped out senselessly by the Buster Call. And I think, like I mentioned in the non-spoiler section, that line, you know, where she, where her dream has too many enemies, you know, the like that line, the way it's delivered, especially knowing what she's had to go through and her enemies, it's, it's brought up again, like just how insurmountable those enemies are, which makes that one moment where Luffy has Usopp burn down the world government flag, knowing that that is her enemy and the fact that they will stand up against her. Like, it's amazing to see this line about how she thinks that all there are too many enemies and they're too strong for her to complete her dream and achieve them and just seeing her give up at this moment. But then to go, you know, 300 or so episodes later to that moment, I think it's amazing, like just the payoffs, like these little strings you start from here going all the way forward, like several years. It's just insane. I mean, Oda is just incredible in that regard. And then kind of some last few little tidbits, I guess. You know, it's funny seeing Zoro 
who was one of the most suspicious of Robin here in her initial joining of the crew, eventually becomes one of Robin's greatest defenders throughout the rest of the series. You know, it's funny because like a lot of the fandom kind of ship Robin and Zoro, but it, I think it's more the fact that, yeah, Zoro, it's, it's strange. Like he just gravitates towards Robin in terms of like whenever she needs support or if she's in trouble, Zoro is always the one that's there to help her. It's pretty interesting, even though Sanji's usually the one that's like all over the, the female crew members. I think Sanji naturally just gravitates towards saving Nami. And then Zoro kind of just like gravitates towards saving Robin. It's interesting that that connection is just like the person that feared and well, not feared, but kind of like was most suspicious of Robin in the beginning it is now one of her greatest like allies. And it's I like that sort of like dichotomy. And then, like I mentioned, we don't get a cheers moment where they all sort of welcome, you know, the new crew member in. But that's because we eventually do get that moment when she truly joins after Water, Water 7 and Aeneas Lobby. And we see her fully embrace the crew members. And along with Frankie's joining and Usopp's return. So it's a very momentous occasion. And it's very delayed, but it's a very delayed gratification. And I like, obviously, I like the, the little sort of tidbit of Robin sort of up until that moment is very impersonal in terms of how she refers to everybody like she refers to them by their titles or their some sort of a defining feature like she'll call Usopp Nagahanakun or long nose or uh, Zoro as Kenshi sang or like swordsman Kok sang saying uh, you know all all of them by their titles but after any asabi she finally opens up and starts calling them by their real names and it's it'll be interesting to talk about during Skypea just seeing Robin's sort of relationship grow with the rest of the crew, culminating with Roger Seven. But that's a more that's a conversation for another time. But anyways, this has been a really long episode, so I'm gonna wrap it up. But yeah, thank you for listening and I will see you on the next episode. Bye.